Prepare to experience the strongest radio allowable by law. Secrets will be revealed. revealed. Myths, Myths dispelled. dispelled. From the studio gym where excuses never apply. It's Superhuman Radio with your host, Carl Lenore. Welcome back to another episode of Superhuman Radio. We have a great show planned for you today. During the first half hour, we're going to be talking with Dr. Jeff Galini, another installment in the Science for Humans uh, episodes. And then uh, we're going to change it up and be joined by a good friend of mine, Aaron Singerman, to talk about a force to be reckoned with. Uh, As you know, Superhuman Radio is being made possible through a special grant from All American Pharmaceuticals, and their product line is All American EFX Sports. Go to superhumanradio.com to learn more. This is Science for Humans with Dr. Jeff Galini. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Jeff. How you doing? I'm doing good. How about you, Carl? Fantastic, fantastic. And this is a really important subject today. Um, and we can't talk about it enough, and the truth of the matter is, no matter where you turn uh, somewhere, there is new research providing us with more content for this discussion, especially in the gloom and dark, desperate days of winter. We just don't get enough vitamin D. So we're going to be talking about vitamin D today, right? We are. Um, you know, as you said, the research continues, um, and it's pretty interesting. So I-, I like to think of vitamin D the way we think of melatonin. We think of melatonin as the nighttime hormone. But we don't really think of vitamin D as the daytime hormone. We think of it as a vitamin. In fact, I saw just today, I was doing cardio this morning, and one of the morning shows uh, had their resident physician on telling people good sources of vitamin D in foods. But there really are no, quote-unquote, good sources of vitamin D because you don't get near the amount in food sources that you get from just spending short times in the sun. Absolutely. I mean, like you said, I call vitamin D the sunshine vitamin, but there aren't very good sources. You can find it in egg yolks um, and some fish oils. I mean, of course, your vitamin D um, fortified milks. But other than that, the sun is your source. And the vitamin D fortified milks, there's a lot of discussion now because they use an inferior form of vitamin D to fortify milk. And in fact, it's a synthetic vitamin D that the vitamin D community is coming out against uh, and saying, in fact, it's dangerous, not helpful at all. Not har- It's not harmless. It's harmful. Yeah, and I mean, you know, there obviously are always two sides of the fence. Um, so there probably are some harmful things. Um, for some people, it may be absorbable. Again, it kind of depends on the amounts that you're getting in from, from that source. So in, in obviously with the lack of sunshine, um, the alternatives then become some food sources. However, as we've acknowledged, these are very, very limited. Uh, but then supplementation, I guess, right? That that really is it. And, you know, for people who also have a, a, a darker skin, you know, as you said, what happens is is this, the sun hits the skin, which produces um, the transformation of uh, vitamin D, so we are limited on where we can get it from food sources unless you want to go eat a whole lot of egg yolks, um, but I don't recommend that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about the color of skin. Uh, when we look at this process from an evolutionary perspective, we realize that those of us with dark skin, like I have, we our ancestors evolved in areas where there was a lot of sunshine, so the uh, selection pressure was for darker skinned people so that there was not an overproduction of vitamin D. There are negative feedback loops built into the the skin that um, will meter the amount of D3 that's actually released into the bloodstream. But save that, if you're a very fair-skinned person versus a very dark-skinned person, you both react very differently to a half hour's worth of sunshine, right? Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, with... uh like myself with darker skin, you know, being from the uh, Italian side of the fence, um, that pigment melamine uh, reduces the skin's ability to make that vitamin D, where, you know, fairer skin people, they burn. Um, so normally they aren't out in the sun as long um, also. 
which and, which, which which makes me wonder again from an evolutionary selection pressure standpoint um, we know from the Scandinavian studies on oral vitamin D supplementation and keep in mind that we have to be careful how we interpret oral vitamin D supplementation research because that is not how our body normally gets vitamin D so it's totally it's metabolized totally differently but with that being said fair skin Scandinavian people can take as little as a thousand IUs a day and get their uh, blood 25 hydroxy levels up pretty quickly where darker skinned people including African Americans take that same small dose and see very very negligible rise which leads me to wonder if those of us with darker skin can actually get by with less vitamin D as a result yeah. of evolution. Yeah, and I mean, I think that would be a good hypothesis. Obviously, there's no real research on it. But I think, uh, you know, nature uh, has a way of adapting humans to different climates. The same way with, you know, people who are in a primarily uh, dark place like Alaska. You know, what happens up there, you know, where they just flat out don't get as much uh, sun as we would say down in Florida and things, you know. So what 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 would you like to discuss specifically about vitamin D today to uh, give people a, a fuller picture of what's important and what and what to pay attention to? I think the most important thing is for, you know, first of all, for people to realize that vitamin D is important. You know, vitamin D most of us probably don't know what it's even good for. So I want to just talk about the fact that it is essential for strong bones. It helps the body to use the calcium um, that we take in from our diets. Um, the other thing is something called rickets, um, which isn't a very common uh, disease. Any of, longer, but in the 20s it was, right? It, it was. You know, and again, it could have been from the diet. It could have been from the air. Who knows? But that's also... Um, associated with low vitamin D, most people probably won't even recognize the symptoms because they're so subtle. But I just want to talk about, you know, what some of the symptoms um, are that basically would cause this. Um, they're they're fairly uh, interesting. Uh, we already talked about, you know, again, not being in the sun um, or taking an adequate amounts and being dark skin. But there's some other things um, your kidneys. There are some folks that their kidneys just can't f convert vitamin D to its act active form. So sometimes the older we get, um, our kidneys start to lose that function. Um, there are some diseases such as Crohn's disease, cystic fibrosis, that our digestive tracts can't adequately absorb the vitamin D. And then this one was really interesting, um, obesity. Um, because vitamin D is extracted from the blood by fat cells. So the more fat cells, the tougher it is to get that vitamin D um, into uh, the system. So those are kind of some of the deficiencies, um, but also... Well, wait, wait, wait. I want to add something to that list. Yes, go ahead. Something that uh, is, is probably less obvious to most people, but is a growing concern amongst uh, doctors who perform bariatric surgery, and that is that uh, once someone has had the, I think it's called the RUNY uh, gastric bypass procedure, they stop absorbing vitamin D through the gut. So yep. this, these individuals are compromised, and even with the most heroic, her heroic supplementation, see very little change uh, in vitamin D in, in 25-hydroxy levels. They are at great risk, and quite frankly... Short of using a topical vitamin D, which I'm not going to pimp, but short of using a topical vitamin D, the best thing for those people is sunlight and sun beds, in my humble opinion. Absolutely. I mean, that is the best way to get it. Here's a couple other things, too, that um, people may not be um, aware of, is that when you have the flu, that's a vitamin D deficiency. Uh, you can guarantee that your vitamin C uh, D levels are done. I even spoke to a couple doctors last week that they recommend to their patients as soon as a sniffle comes on to increase their vitamin D, whether it be to go out in the sun um, or to, you know, try to get something from their diet. Um, if you got muscle weakness, um, that's another D uh, deficiency. Um, chronic kidney disease, uh, diabetes, asthma. Um, cardiovascular disease, which we'll kind of talk a little bit later in the show about some uh, recent research, uh, schizophrenia and depression, and then this was interesting, cancer. 
Um, the Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, D.C. discovered a, a connection between vitamin D and reduced uh, breast cancer. So that was uh, something new for me that I discovered. Uh, well, the, the, the really interesting uh, link between cancer and vitamin D levels came out of Wake Forest University when they were working on some cancer research. And one of the little mice that they injected with active cancer cells, uh, did not develop cancer like the rest of his litter mates. And, in fact, they took this one mouse and sequestered it and injected this mouse with a threefold the amount that the other mice got, and they all succumbed to the cancer, and, and he still resisted it. So when they started to look at this mouse, they found out that he had an anomaly, that he overproduced um, 25-hydroxy, but more important, calcitriol, which is one of the less uh, investigated but now emerging uh, metabolites of vitamin D, active vitamin D. And they ended up creating a whole line of transgenic mice that overproduce vitamin D specifically for cancer research. They could not give these mice cancer no matter what they uh, exposed them to. And that was one of the earliest uh, research papers that linked vitamin D to cancer. It was amazing. Yeah, it is. And there's been a couple more since then that have had uh, just as good of success. Let me ask you something. What do you think? Uh, we're, we're telling people to go out in the sun. What about all the stuff about too much sun causes, you know, different types of skin cancer? I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy it, Dr. Jeff. And I'll tell you why. Um, we, we've spent thousands of years, and if you want to argue a couple million years, indirect exposure of the sun um if you look at recorded history and you look at the rates of melanoma they closely parallel the use of sunscreen uh you look at uh, uh sub-saharan uh africans that live there and spend all day in the sun and they do not develop melanomas they move to the united states and they develop melanoma. What, what, something else is afoot here. It's not the sun, in my humble opinion. There's something else going on. Now, it could be that there are things in our environment that have specific inflammatory effects, specifically on the skin. Or it could be diets devoid of certain uh, uh, nutrients that set the skin up that when it's stimulated by the sun, something rogue happens that isn't supposed to happen. So I'm not saying I, I'm a conspiracy theorist, oh, sunscreen is causing cancer. But what I am saying is sun has not done this except until very, very recent times. Something else is going on. We cannot demonize the sun. It's It's been part of our evolutionary gift to, to, to the, the things that we produce vitamin D in the skin for a reason. So we can't demonize the sun. We have to look deeper and find out what's making the sun bad for some people and not others. I'm a sun worshiper, Dr. Jeff. I've laid in the sun. When I was a young man in my 20s, I lived in Vegas. I laid in the sun every <laughs> single day. I lay in the sun every chance I get now as well. We have a pool in the backyard. I, I don't have any melanoma. I don't, use no. sun, I don't even use sunscreen. I use the worst thing you can, Hawaiian Tropic Dark Tanning Oil. It's like putting it's like putting little magnifying glasses on your skin. Oh, well, you know, and I have to agree with you. I wanted to see what you had to say on that. Um, I think it is funny that you know all of a sudden it's the sun's fault when you know again as we we're talking about our bodies were created to get vitamin D from the sun. Now all of a sudden we're saying, well, don't go in the sun, and now we have all these other things that could happen. Um, so I do have to agree with you, but I, I do like the sun also, and my uh, suntan oil is worse than what you use, so I won't even mention it. Wait, I bet I can guess. I bet I guess. it's baby oil and iodine. <laughs> do you remember yeah, that? No, do you remember when the girls used to use baby oil and iodine oh, to get that golden bronze look? That's what I used to use. Uh, I don't use the iodine anymore, but I do like the baby oil. But yeah. actually, that is the best way to get a nice golden tan, especially if you have a, a slightly darker tan, um, you know, or slightly darker skin. But it does work. I wonder what that does to your thyroid. All that, all absorbing some of that iodine <laughs> on your whole body. 
I, mean, I don't know. It, it's been a long time, but that was kind of one of the old bodybuilding secrets. Yeah, friend, baby oil and iodine. It was great. Tom Platt's, uh, he used to get so golden brown, and I said, Tom, what's your secret? And he told me, so I thought, ah, that's cheap, so I'll do it. But you smelled like iodine. Do you remember that smell? It was almost like a metallic smell that your body gave off when you had that stuff on. Yeah, but the good thing is it kept the mosquitoes away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) So uh, let's do this. Let's go ahead and take our break now. When we come back, let's talk about some of the uh, information you want to talk about related to cardiovascular disease and vitamin D deficiency. We're talking with Dr. Jeff Galini. This is Science for Humans. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Freakish muscle gains, Freak Maker Build from AAEFX. It's a scientifically engineered post workout formula that combines protolin, whey isolate, whey concentrate, milk isolate, casein, and egg, quality protein sources with carbolin, pre alkaline, and medium chain triglycerides. A two to one carb to protein ratio to optimize post training recovery and repair. Freak Maker Build delivers 58 grams of fast absorbing carbolin to replenish glycogen stores and 1.5 grams of pre alkaline pH buffered creatine monohydrate get freak maker mill today go to superhumanradio.com and click the aaefx banner ad new from the makers of mass pro synthogen progenidrex is finally available to everyone refined for years and elite athletes it's the absolute pinnacle of products specifically designed to accelerate drug-free muscle growth without hormones using progenidrex as directed results in dramatic increases in muscle size pumps and recovery from heavy training won't disrupt endocrine function and no need to cycle off. Visit PredatorNutrition.com and Fusion Supplements for the absolute last word in non-hormonal anabolics. Progenidrax. Performance counts, especially in the bedroom. Age Force introduces the Ready Now Sexual Performance Patch. Feel eight hours of increased performance within minutes of putting on the Ready Now Patch. Go to SuperHumanRadio.com and click the Ready Now banner ad and save 50% off your first order. Move over, superheroes. This is the Superhuman Channel. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio. Come for the information, stay for the music. We have the best music of any podcast out there. I challenge you to find anybody's podcast who has these songs. They don't. All right, welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Jeff Galini. We're talking about vitamin D deficiencies right now. So, most recent study that I've been sent shows that vitamin D deficiency is closely linked to... um, Insulin resistance more so than diabetes, but that's still very, very promising. What, what about cardiovascular disease, Dr. Jeff? Yeah, you know, um, there is a, a recent study that was done over in Finland at the University of Turku. Um, and this, this showed that uh, low childhood vitamin D was linked to adult uh, arteriosclerosis. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. Think about, now had, think about all those parents out there who slather their children with banana boat you know, SPF 95, and then take them out to the pool. Well, this is why. I mean, in this this subjects group was over 2,100 um, kids. So, I mean, it was a large uh, group that was, was checked. Um, so, again, you know, what is arteriosclerosis? It's kind of a long word, a uh, big word. But essentially what happens is uh, you get uh, deposits of this uh, arteriomatous plaque that contains cholesterol and lipids, that develop on the innermost uh, layer walls of the large and medium-sized arteries. So obviously this doesn't happen in a short amount of time. It's something that would happen over time, but that is one of the main causes for, for heart disease, you know, any type of plaque buildup or cholesterol lipid buildup. So, you know, this particular study showed that, you know, again, kids with low levels um, probably will have some uh cardiovascular diseases when they when they grow up. You but know? isn't it funny that we just focus on cardiovascular disease? Let's be clear about this. This phenomenon is called stenosis. It's a narrowing of blood vessels, especially arteries that carry oxygenated blood to organ systems and to every important piece of tissue in the body. 
while a stenosis in an important artery uh, to the heart from from the heart will cause a heart attack, which is, you can't deny that, right? But there's right. more there's slowly progressing diseases related to stenosis. Everything from uh, dementia, you know, let, let's talk about um, carotid artery blockages that lead to dementia. That's a stenosis. Right. Those are probably tied to vitamin D deficiency as well. Well, and this is the other thing that, you know, again, nothing against uh, our healthcare uh, practitioners and psychiatrists, but when someone is depressed, what's the first thing they do? Put them on, Let's them on a drug. Right. Guess what? That's a vitamin D dis- deficiency. You know, our brain has receptors that need vitamin D for normal brain development and just the mental function to maintain life. I mean, how about let's try some vitamin D first? Well, you, you know, you're, you're, you're much too gracious uh, to say what I'm going to say. And that <laughs> I is that, you I, probably have well, the, psychi- the psychiatric industry, in my humble opinion, is, is mostly pseudoscience today. They're, they're trying to, they're trying to tag people who, Eat clean or focus on healthy eating as having a mental illness. It, it's, it's, it's a really scary group, uh, of clinicians out there that are trying to overreach and create, make every single human, uh, habit a mental disorder, including biting your own nails. They call that compulsive grooming. So, I mean, it's, they, they will never give vitamin D to anybody because they don't want people to get better. With that no. being said, um, let's talk a little bit about vitamin D testing for a second. So very easy. Th- yeah, the, 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 the vitamin D testing is very simple thanks to labs like ZRT Lab. They do a blood spot test. Uh, it's called a Wattman blotter. It looks like a book of matches with a, a a pad of paper inside of it. You drop six or seven blood drops on it. You send it in. They give you a 25-hydroxy uh, reading back. But I predict that in the upcoming years, this is not going to be adequate. We're going to learn a couple things. First of all, 25 hydroxy is a good starting point, point, but calcitriol may play a bigger role, as will uh, vitamin D sulfate, the sulfated version of vitamin D, in conferring all of the benefits of vitamin D that we're coming to learn about. And a better method of determining if someone has, remember what I was talking about before, maybe dark-skinned people need less vitamin D? Mm-hmm, right. There's a way to find out if you're in your sweet spot of vitamin D. And that's to look at parathyroid hormone in the presence of supplementation. Because parathyroid hormone starts to go wrong when levels are too high or too low. So you can actually find the sweet spot for someone when testing by looking at parathyroid hormone as well. This was, this is not my idea. A very brilliant young man that I'm working with on the Primal D project, Dr. Chris Masterjohn. He's the first one that started promoting this idea on my show, quite frankly, about five years ago. And it's really caught on within uh, the vitamin D community. Now they're starting to understand it's it, there. Everybody has their sweet spot. How do you determine that? Parathyroid hormone can give you a glimpse of that. Yeah, and I think that is is really good um, and probably the best way to go. But I also found that you know, again, until somebody can actually get that, you can get some home tests that even though they may not be as accurate, you'll at least know whether you're in you know, a deficient uh, level of D, which means go take a walk. Yeah, get out in the sun. Yeah. So now, now you're up in Montana. You, it, How is the sun right now at this time of the year? You know, the one good thing about Montana is we're up 3,500 feet, so uh, we do have sun during the wintertime. Oh. Um, it's not like some places where it's cloudy all the time, but we're pretty much covered up. So the only place that, that hits is uh, faces. But I do think people out here during the winter are deficient in D. Now, summertime, we're out in the yards because we've only got a good three months' worth of uh, summertime. So people are laying out. They're out working. We're getting plenty. Um, but it is tough in, in winter areas, you know, during that wintertime. I, I think I think uh, sun beds, not tanning beds, but sun beds are a good alternative too. And I, and I want to differentiate. The tanning bed became a phenomenon when the role of, that sun played in tanning skin, like the pharmaceutical companies that isolate a particular active component of something and just want to use that. We just use the rays that seem to be responsible for tanning that the sun emits and created bulbs to create that environment. And that's when tanning went bad because you need all the rays from the sun, we've learned. And so 
when I was a young man, they had sun lamps. These mm. lamps put out the full waveform seen by the sun. It didn't just isolate a couple. I think we need to get back to that technology. We, we do, and I remember years ago, uh, way years ago, all the hotels used to have a sun lamp. Yeah, in their remember that? Yeah, my <laughs> mother, my mother, and my sister had a sun lamp. It had a big uh, uh, alligator clip on it, and they would yeah. clip it to like the back of this the bed, sit in a chair, and face it for a couple, you know, fifteen twenty minutes at a time, and it gave your skin a nice red glow. But it it did so much more that we are just starting to understand now. Somebody needs to bring back the sun bed. Not the well, tanning maybe need, bed. Maybe we need to go find and see if there's any sun bulbs out there, um, and we'll let everybody know where they can get them at. And one of the things I, w- I did want to say is, you know, we were kind of talking about all these dangerous things like cancer, and I don't want people to go away thinking, oh, I'm going to die, because it's very easy to get your vitamin D. Like I said, just get out in the sun, or maybe we'll find some sun lamps for you. There you go. Dr. Jeff, thank you for being on the show today as usual. Thank you much. Take right, care. Talk soon.